This is Film Center, your number one show for real entertainment industry news. No fluff, all facts. Now, here are your anchors, Derek Johnson II and Nicholas Killian. Hey everyone, welcome to Film Center, your number one place for studio news. I'm Derek Johnson II. I'm Nicholas Killian. And what are we getting in today, Nicholas? Today, we're going to be talking about IATSE. And actually, we're after, after the strike of the WGA and SAG, people assumed that IATSE was also going to strike. And for you guys that didn't don't know what IATSE is, the IATSE is the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees. Yeah, so basically they're not the writers and they're not the actors. They're literally everyone else who's the, under the line. Right. So they're the grips, they're the key grips, they're the gaffers, the electricians, the best boys, the production assistants, the production hands, the all, all like when you go to see a movie the when you leave, that's all those people who are on the screen. That's who all those that, guys are. That's who all those guys are. After you see the actors and you're like, oh, okay, cool. That was the director. I know who he is. And then you get up and leave. Everyone else who's part of IATSE is then on the screen. Exactly. And the all the people that made it possible for everybody on that screen to look as good as they do, to sound as good as they do, all of that is IATSE. It's always a, a huge team effort. A lot of people say, man, I love that Quentin Tarantino movie or I love that... that it doesn't really matter. They'll name some director or they'll name some, oh man, The Rock was, I love The Rock's movie. Yeah, there was like <laughs> at minimum 200 people who helped get this thing made. More, without, yeah. Pro- easily more. Easily more. And without every single one of them, it would not be possible. And the thing is, as much as people complain about actors and writers and directors, I see people get treated worse than the name staff way worse because no one knows who they are and you'll never know who they are but the thing is they get more work yeah yeah see the writers and actors and directors they also compete for very small slots ayatsi they're working every day it's like a nine to five forever yeah they're basically guaranteed work i have a teacher of mine he's in ayatsi he's a makeup artist yeah and they work they work longer hours than name staff Oh, most definitely. Most they're, definitely. they're there before you get there, and they're there after you leave. When I was a key grip on one of Bill Duke's movies, I, oh my gosh, man. I, I've, been a, I've been a key grip for Bill Duke, and I've also been a camera op for Bill Duke. And I ran his, his C-cam for one of the movies that he did. And you get there, your call time is usually some sometime super early in the morning and by the way that's good your call time is like <laughs> four or five o'clock in the morning that is that's a good sign for me my call time was i think the earliest call time i had on either one of bill duke's movies was like six six a.m because if you get a call time because usually the actors are there they're working for eight hours max mm-hmm. and they're up then they're down up they're down they're waiting for us to set up if they're on set for eight hours max. If you're a grip, if you're a grip or you're part of a yacht, so you're doing the background stuff, you're there for 12 minimum usually. Oh, yeah. You could be there easily 16. Oh, easily. And if you get a call time on a sheet that says, hey, get there at the afternoon, you're like, oh, man, this is like a late day shoot or like worse, an overnight shoot. I, there's a saying they have. They say overnight shoots test friendships, and it's so true. Like I have been on some sets where – these people were my really good friends. And then it just takes one overnight shoot to make you say, man, this person is really annoying because it's four in the morning. You've been working for 10 hours. <laughs> right. And, you're just- and, and this person decides, oh, you know what? I don't feel like working as hard. So I'm going to start doing stuff to mess up. And now you have to do more stuff. Nah, bro. But anyways, we sit there thinking, okay, why is Etsy not striking along with SAG, AFTRA, and the WGA, right? It's a way bigger... It's a way bigger union. They have over 170,000 members. Like they, like I said, it's a very large union with members in over 100 companies, which makes it more difficult to coordinate a strike. Yeah, and that's true. the thing is, also what you have is IATSE has a long history of working with the studios to reach agreements. So because they're more integral 
to all of the goings on of movies, they're obviously a lot closer to the studios than, say, maybe SAG AFTRA or the Writers Union. And by closer leadership, not workers. Yeah, and I, this is going to come off a little wrong, but I don't, like, it doesn't mean that SAG or WGA is not as important. But what I will say is, it's a lot easier to replace writers, replace, if you aren't working on a TV show, replace like 10 writers or for a movie really a couple writers and it's a lot easier to replace actors than it is to replace possibly 200 people who all have one specialized job yeah like you you can't even cast for that you had to ask other people if they know someone and IATSE provides this invaluable roster they don't have really the and that's part of the reason why they're so close is because literally studios cannot operate without these people yeah no it's not even an option it's not even like what I do and what my teacher does you can't you can't have people for that like making facial hair pieces the fact that he's a makeup artist that can do basically every discipline in the makeup artistry realm now this doesn't mean that people don't try to replace them because they do oh. your if i can recall your teacher the universal has tried to replace them a couple times and wasn't able to yeah so basically what happens is because it's so specialized it i'll give you an example right so a very small example is he's had a contract with universal to do beetlejuice headpieces for over 20 years right now, the Beetlejuice headpieces are not anything big. It's literally the Universal Park that has the Beetlejuice headpieces, right? Now, the thing is, the reason why he's had the contract for so long, and this is an uh, example of many different areas in his life, is the fact that they have tried to go and get other people to do this. For a lower price, probably. For a lower price, for whatever they want, Fill in the example. Maybe have some guy full time to do only Beetlejuice here, whatever. And they've gone back to him every single time for two decades. For two, for over two decades, doesn't even want to do it anymore. What people don't understand is like movies and TV shows and stuff like that. It's a giant clock, and actors are more like the face. Like you can't really the numbers, the hand. It is those things might be no they're not i don't mean, say replaceable like you can get another one mainly mm -hmm. because of i'm saying like, when it comes to actors and writers there's like proportionally a hundred people competing for one job when you are dealing with iatsi members they're the actual cogs of the watch so you need all one it's 100 people com competing for 100 jobs you know what i mean like you need every single one of these people to work every single one of these jobs compared to i have it's like supply and demand if I have, a, there's tons of demand and a little supply, then obviously I get to pick and choose what I want to do. And then you also sit there and you think about, okay, what is the reason, what is another reason why they're not striking? Is be, It's not that they're more, it, they're, it's not because they're not as powerful, but it's also because of the rise of streaming. It's also because there is substantially more non-union work. Yeah in the entertainment industry as far as those support jobs than you can for union membership. Yeah. Union job. Like A lot of these IFC people are not being paid on residuals like the writers in, the, no. in SAG. They're being paid for being there on set. Right. So when streaming comes along, there's just more jobs, which means more money for them. It doesn't necessarily mean that because they're not already not working off of residuals. They don't right. really, they're not getting residuals. They just need to be on set. So as long as there are sets, and now that there are more of them, they can still work. Yeah, but like I said, it makes it more difficult for the union to bargain for significant concessions from studios because there is so much more work. Like, my teacher was telling me, he was like, okay, listen, it... I think back in the day, it was like three grand to join sag After, right? It's double that to join IATSE. But the reason why he said it was double that is because you get double the work. Right. You're basically get it's the amount of money that you can make. If you're like, oh, I want to come out to L.A., right? And you say, I want to be a writer or a director. You're like, oh, good luck because there's not that many jobs. If you say, oh, I want to be an IATSE, they're like, oh, okay, cool. That's like saying, oh, I want to be, I don't know, like a fireman. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very doable journey. And like we said, IATSE 
is over 170,000 workers, right? And we've already established that it is the cogs of the machine of the watch. You, we, you can have TV shows without actors and writers, but you can't have anything without IOTC members. You cannot AI IOTC. You can't. You can say, oh, AI can write stuff. Oh, maybe I can even have CGI actors that are generated through AI, whatever. Okay, an AI software is not going to pick up that light and hang it from the roof. <laughs> and back in 2021, they had averted the strike by signing a tentative deal. And then IOTC's current contract with the studios expires on July 31st. 2023 so it's already expired they right. signed a pink contract with with the broadway workers to make sure tentatively nothing goes underwater but the union has been in negotiations with everything since january of this year yeah and once again these studios they're like there's a reason why you don't hear so much about, you always hear about how writers are underpaid and, you know, what they go through. You always hear about actors and what they go through and stuff like that. There's a reason why you don't hear so much. Like, I obviously is basically the Teamsters of, yeah, of Hollywood. It's everybody. It's literally everybody from the top down. If I actually went on strike and was like, we're done, it's like the government shutting down. Like, nothing's moving. Also, the thing is that IATSE and the studios aren't very far apart in their demands. So, because, like you said, the studios realize if they try and screw over IATSE, that's it. That's done. They're, like, once again, there's so many, there's so much work. You need tons and tons of people. But so the studios have all offered IATSE a 3% wage increase over the next three years, right? And the union is seeking a 4% wage increase over three years, as well as improvements to health care and pension benefits. Right. So if you look at it, they're not that far off. Yes, they're far off, but they're not as far off as the actors and the writers. They can negotiate with the actors and writers because, like we said, supply and demand. But they can't do that with the Yahtzee. Like, they, right. they're, they know that they're incapable. It's like saying, okay, if I have a band, okay, like I have a marching band. And the actor is, the actors are like some of the dancers. And then the writer, he's more the coordinator, I guess. And then you have the director who might be the conductor, okay? Ayatsi is every single band member. <laughs> so Ayatsi is the instruments, is yeah. the oh, uniforms, right. <laughs> is the shoes, the who laces. Made the uniforms. <laughs> the thing is, if Ayatsi went on strike, it would last maybe a week. And because of this, they're very similar in their demands because Ayanti says, we want more work. And the studios say, we want to make more productions. So it goes hand in hand. What they are differentiating in is with the writers and actors is payment is the huge one. Also talking about AI, right? This does not affect Ayatsi at all. Also, the studios can't afford to have Ayatsi go on strike. Oh, they they like, literally can't. The studios can afford the actors and the writers to go on strike because right. the pandemic allowed us allowed them to really backlog a lot of shows. But that's it. It would cost the studios literally billions of dollars very quickly it, if Ayatsi went on strike. It would be so bad. Like A lot of the executives would not even go into work that day. They'd be like, all right, cool. There's no reason for me to do anything. There, there's no reason. Yeah. And the thing is, they've, but they have already gone and authorized a strike. IATSE and its members have already authorized through, I think they have to, it's a 98% vote. Yeah. And 98% of its workers have already authorized IATSE to go on strike. The reason why IATSE is not going on strike is because the leadership is probably really cozy with the studios. Yeah, I yeah, I would agree with that. Although it's like to people who are a little bit confused because that might have confused some people. Once again, this is Film Center. And here in Film Center, both me and Nicholas work in the industry. Right. So, we're not coming out of a perspective that's oh, we're just like guessing here. When it comes to unions and the way that they strike, they have to vote first. And then later on, they will decide if they're actually technically on strike. For example, SAG, 
voted to go on strike and then didn't go on strike for some time. Same thing with the WGA. And I honestly did vote. Let's say they said, oh, yeah, we're going to go on strike. But to be fair, like you said, the leadership is pretty cozy with the studios. The studios know how much. Then the reason why they're cozy is because the studios need them so badly. So there's no way to AI Otzi. So now that AI Otzi, uh, now that AI Otzi, <laughs> AI A- A-I- Otzi, AI <laughs> Otzi, now that AI Otzi has decided, oh well, yeah, we voted to go on strike. The studios are probably still going to give them whatever they want, and before they actually officially go on strike, what this usually means is that okay, they voted to go on strike for. Really, any reasons they feel like it. Just a union. They can go on strike when they feel like it. So then they can say, oh, okay, we voted. So now we're going to present our case to the studios, right? And be like, hey, if you don't give us what we want, we'll be officially on strike. And I guarantee you the studios are going to bend. They don't have a choice. Yeah. And then the thing is the last... They don't know how to make their own coffee. (laughs) The last time they went on strike was 1988. And it did not last very long at all. How long did that one last? I believe it was, I think they said a couple months. Yeah, I think it was like 45 days. but And this is according to IATSE's website that 98% of eligible union voters cast ballots in the strike authorization with more than 98% of them in support of strike authorization. That means that about 162,000 IATSE members are in favor and voted in favor of authorizing the strike. So maybe what some of our audience doesn't understand is that just because you vote to go on strike does not mean that you go on strike. The right. leadership has to then say, okay, yes, we're going to go on strike. And then also, once again, they're only going to go on strike once they, after they informed the studios, like, hey, we're about to go on strike if you don't meet these demands. Because if they tell the studios that, we're go- that they're going to go on strike unless the demands are met and the studios meet those demands immediately, then the strike is canceled. And like I said, the the valley in between what IATSE wants and what the studio wants, it's really not that far off. It's very close. They're really just talking about semantics for the most part compared to the other two unions that are talking about real change. Also, the issue with going on strike and probably the most important issue with IATSE going on strike is the fact that... I'm not saying that writers and actors don't – IATSE members, this is their 9 to 5. Yeah. It, it's not – It's like, their daily job. It's their daily job. They don't have money saved up. They can't afford to go on strike. Yeah, they I'm, don't – They don't. you're not going to see them driving. Like, a lot, like some actors and writers can get rich off what they're doing. You do not get rich off of IATSE. You do get to go on a whole bunch of really cool movies. All of – I am not officially with IATSE myself, but I Me worked, neither. But I worked alongside with the union for quite some time now, and like you get on some really big sets, you get to meet some really famous people, and that's all real cool. But that's your that's your daily job. You're not gonna get rich off of this. You're not gonna get rich off of it. You're going to pay your rent. Right. You're gonna pay your rent. You're gonna pay your car note. You're gonna go to Starbucks, and that's yeah. it. Yeah. You're not driving any Teslas. You're not. You're driving a Honda. Not to say that act that you know that writers and actors, but typically writers and actors, I would say, wouldn't you say in your experience, they do better than... I would say the possibility to do better is... Yeah, so the possibility. The possibility, because I cannot... I can tell you, like, not all... (laughs) It was crazy is that... So I work independently. I am an independent. I'm not attached to any union, which allows me to do non-union work. Mm -hmm. And I often make a lot more than some of the doji some of my WJ friends. and But everyone knows the big people in WJ, like Aaron Sorkin, who are these huge writers who make millions of dollars. I do not make as much as he does, clearly. But that's a possibility that you can have being in WJ. There's a poss- everyone knows all these A-list actors who have all these millions and millions of dollars. There's a possibility in SAG. It's not a possibility in IATSE. Because a lot of these rich actors and writers that you see, they get rich off of residuals. And they get rich off of points on the back end. You don't get that with IATSE. You get no. you. They say, "Hey, you know what? You worked X amount of hours. You get a paycheck <laughs> in the mail." And they right. say, and "You hey, fill go. out the little form on set. It's just it's just like being an extra on set. Yeah. You you fill out the form. I th- and the thing is, like you said, there is so much work. 
it's it there is so much non-union work yeah. right there you do have union work but there is so much non-union work non-union work being anything that any other set needs work with and contrary to a lot of to people who don't know anything about hollywood most work in los angeles atlanta toronto and canada and new like, york city new york Nashville. It's all non-union. Louisiana. Most of it's non-union. In fact, I would say percentage-wise, I would say in the entertainment business as a whole, I would argue that like 75% of it, that's not a crazy number, 75% being non-union because you're also talking about commercials. All commercials are non-union. You're also talking about like podcast. Like this is a podcast. Yeah, this This is podcast we're on right now. This is non-union work. Also con- contributing to the decline of membership, right? Mm-hmm. So the rise of streaming services have made it easier for the studios to produce union, produce movies and TV shows without hiring union labor. Yeah. You have the decline of the theatrical film industry. It leads to you don't have to hire union people. You just had to hire someone who knows what they're doing. That's all you need. That's it. Yeah, comparative to, and especially because with IATSE members, here's another huge reason why it's so much, an IATSE job is so much more secure than SAG and WGA. Sometimes studios and production companies, they're hiring the writers based off their name to mm-hmm. sell the movie. They're hiring the actors based off their name. Because of an NDA, I can't really say the recent movie I was on, but you're not seeing it because of me. Like, you're not. You're seeing it because... La- it's labor. You're not seeing it. You're like, oh, who did the key grip on this? I, mean, I hope it's I hope it's Derek. <laughs> no, you're going to be there to see the, the A-list actor that's on it. And they also do it to save money, right? Yeah. It's, it's way cheaper to hire some non-union person than to hire a union IATSE member. It saves them money, and it gives me way more money because I can get guaranteed days so what they so sometimes when you're non-union, they will still guarantee you days if you're if you're tight with production, and it's way easier to get your foot into the door. I've met so many high-level people through working those lower union, lo, lower non-union jobs. Plus, plus with uh, with that support staff type of work type of role, you're not you could be guaranteed work, mm-hmm. but like you said, you have to be tight with production. And yeah, we can get into that in a different episode, how to do that type of stuff. But I would suggest anyone who wants to get, quote unquote, let's say you get on one of these sets. A lot of first people sets, it's not going to be with Universal. It's going to be with some studio that you've never heard of. Mine actually was with the studio that some people might be familiar with. My first feature that I was on was with Asylum, which some people know them for Sharknado and some other mod movies they make. But it was a lot of fun getting to know them and stuff like that. And then what will happen is that you do a good job. As well as wild as they as that sounds, they love seeing people actually work and do good work, and they'll call you for the next one. And originally, I was put on when you're non-union, you're you don't have a certain contract. You're either they want you there or they don't, right? So I originally just went. I can't even name this movie right now, but whatever. <laughs> but they get a contract, so you can go there for one day, and then they'll put you on for three more days if you want. I was. We were talking about the last strike of 1988. It lasted 28 days and resulted in a number of concessions from studios, including a 4% wage increase over three years and improved health care benefits. So I, so we were, so to retract the earlier statement, it was not a couple of months. It was not even a month. Yeah. Compared to how long they're doing the WJ and, S- and SAG strike. So for how long, indefinitely, they were like, yeah, we can't even survive a month without these guys. No, not a month. Because here's the thing that I think people don't understand about IATSE. It is everyone on the set. Like, if and that's hard to imagine. So let's break it down a little bit. So I'll give you an example, right? You have the actors and the writers. Let's say you have 100 people. The actors and the writers are two people. Yeah. The proportionally, r- yeah. I would say that's correct. Proportionally. Out of 100, they would be two. Two people, 98%, 98 other people 
is IATSE. Literally, it's from the Teamsters van. The people that pick you up in the van. It's something that people don't even think about. Oh, the actors gotta get there somehow. And let me tell you, the trailers also gotta get there somehow. The guys who bring their trailers for them to be driven to. <laughs> it's, it is everything from the top down. Yeah. Every, all of it. All of it. All they those didn't. names that you see after the actors and directors and all all those names that you see that are super small, but it fills up the screen for a long time. And so they can't even go a month. Speaking of the screen, Nicholas and I recently got to go check out Regal's new experience. Yeah. The screen X. We went to go see a Gran Turismo. The It's based off a true story about a sim driver who got to become a real race car driver. He's from the U.K., we're not going to review the movie. That's not really what we do here. I, although my opinion of the movie was is that it started off It was too okay. long. <laughs> Nick thought it was too long. Yeah. It started off okay, but it got better in the end. Which, it, got, it got really good in the, towards the end. Right. Which it know, was The first half of it was real slow. It was kind of weird. It felt like I was watching an independent movie, even though it clearly wasn't marketed that way and actually didn't need to be that way. I feel like someone might have blown the budget on the race cars and the PD, but they needed the cars. Right. It's about racing. Dude, the cars were... Ooh. Right. Anyway, let's talk about Screen X. The Screen X, it's 270 degrees. Right. Which, if that's confusing to you, so 360 is all the way around. People, everyone knows that. Most right. people know that. <laughs> so, right. the way you usually watch a screen, you usually watch it 180, where it's just in front of you. Just the screen. Right. Well, actually, 180, yeah, just when it's right in front of you. 270, it's in front of you, and it's on your left and on your right. Now, the way they did for this movie in Gran Turismo is that you saw it, it spread out on the side sometimes, and sometimes yeah, it was right. just in front, and it seemed a little bit random to me. Yeah, I, like I was telling you during the movie, I was like, why don't they just have it on all the time? It felt like it would have been way better on all the time. It feels like a bit of technology that... Really, filmmakers have not cut up. To, it feels like how 3D was at first. Mm. 3D, they were just doing stuff. They didn't really understand how to use Spy it. kids. Yeah. <laughs> just reaching out to you. Yeah. But, no, the thing is, what I thought was, what I thought was, like I said, I just thought it was real random. Yeah. And the thing was, is that when you look to the side of them, it wasn't as clear as the screen. Yeah, the sides, like, the sides were very blurry. I told Nick this in the screening. I was like, it seems like they were, like, AI-generated sides. That's how weird they looked. And it felt like they had just taken the, or maybe they just punched in to the screen and then just stretched out the edges. But it's like, you shouldn't have done that. You should have recorded it properly so it can actually be on 270. It looked like it was a movie that wasn't supposed to be 270 that they then edited it to try to make it 270. But once again, this is me saying I don't think the filmmakers were expecting them to show it in this way. I think it was more of a marketing thing. And they were like, oh, how do we do this? But I was looking up some stuff and what I saw was like the first Screen X theater opened in South Korea in 2012. Yeah. And then the first Screen X theater in the United States opened in 2018. And they're not everywhere. No, they're... we couldn't. We could only find one, and it, we just so happened to be near it. Yeah, it was crazy because we we live in Los Angeles County, so we're thinking like, oh, there's gonna be a bunch of them. There's gonna be no. there was one. And I will say this: if it's there were some parts of the movie. Like, it's, like we said, it was random. They didn't really seem like they were meant for that. But there were certain parts of the movie where the 270 did increase my experience. Oh, yeah. I definitely think that there were parts of it that it really increased. It really increased the viewing experience. But then the thing was, is it would just fall away. Yeah, I think that's what made, like you said earlier, I would, it should just be there. It should just, just be there consistently. Just, yeah. And then if you're going to take away the size, there be, should be some, like, moment in the story where something gets, like, real intimate. And then I could see the, why the sides will be black or not as important. But it should just be always 270. Like I said, I don't think it was shot in that expectation. Now, the real question is that when we're talking about 270 and Screen X, what we're really talking about is Regal Cinema's way to counteract AMC's take over the world. <laughs> yeah. And I personally, I really think that... 270 could work when we it was a racing movie so it's possible that it needs to be a certain type of movie for 270 degrees to be working with but it made me, made me feel like i was in the car i think the thing is so whenever we walked into the movie theater 
it didn't look any different. Yeah, that was the crazy part. Because we're like, oh, 270, blah, blah, blah. It's 270 feet wide and 70 feet tall. And we walked in there and we were like... 70 degrees, yeah. And so we were just like... It wasn't until the movie came on, the previews were 180. All the previews were just that regular screen in front of you. And then... The second set of previews that they have like the previews and then they have the long movie previews. Yeah. And those long movie previews were in the 270. They When they were flexing, oh, hey, look, this is the type of screen that you're watching. And that presentation was really cool. But that presentation was cool because it was designed with the 270 in mind. They knew where you were going to be looking. They knew it was going to be on the left side. It's going to be on the right side. It really made me feel like I was at a theme park, like those 4D theme park kind of stuff. Except it was a professional movie. And the thing with the surround sound and with all the stuff, I was like, but then I thought, like you said, it was just random. Like it was just very random. I was like, this could have been done really well if you had just kept it on the whole time. If you, I don't know what the, I don't know what the mechanics of it, but if you could have it on at that point, then why wouldn't you just have it on all the time? Yeah. We might talk about the way that this might impact, because Regal Cinemas now also has its own, it's not called the A-List, but they do have their own membership now that's competing with AMC's A-List. And we might talk about how positive we think this all might, their new experience might be compared to AMC, whether we think they might be able to take over or not. But is my current opinion, before we do more research to into it, and if you would like to hear that type of episode, let us know. But it's my current opinion that I think that the 270 could work very well. You just need to make the movie with the 270 in mind. Right. It's more of a gimmick right now. Right. Just 3D started off as a gimmick before people started to use it for certain reasons, right? They, instead of using it for overdoing stuff with Spiky S3D, even though when I came out, I thought it was fun because I was a kid. Right. But, <laughs> but when Avatar was using it, when Avatar was using it, it was the using it just as a depth right. to help you immerse in the depth. And that was like, okay, this is the right way to use 3D after we've done five years of randomness. And a, and I gotta say this, I, did, I liked it better than IMAX. Yeah, I did too. Because the thing is, it had the 270 viewing, and then, of course, it had the projections, and then it had the surround sound, and I was like, oh, this is much better. Another clue to me that the filmmakers did not intend for it to be stretched to the 270 degrees is that when you're watching the the pre like the preview where they're showing, oh, look, it's 270, and they have these stripes going around and stuff like that around you, which is really cool, they're all crystal clear on the side walls. When we were watching the movie, it was blurry a little bit on the side walls. Yeah, exactly. No, I completely agree. I think that this could do really well for Avengers Endgame and Mission Impossible and Fast and the Furious. It seems like it's bred for action movies. I would love to see Indiana Jones in this. I would love to see any any fantasy movie, period. Lord, Lord of the, the Rings, Rings, Jinx. Would, Lord of the Rings would dominate the theaters if they were shown in 270. Dude. Dominate. I would, I ain't gonna lie to you, I would watch. I would pay a premium dollar to see Lord of the Rings in 270 with the panoramic viewing and projection of screens. And at first I thought my neck would like hurt going left, but no, it actually, it didn't bother me at all. I think that 360, it also let me know that 360 would have been too much. Yeah. 360 would have been too much, but it turns out 270, it keeps my interest. It really does. Well, 270 also is your complete field of vision in front of you. I thought it was... And then, of course, you have your peripherals. which It, is, it gets the peripherals. And so the thing is, maybe that's why they didn't make it crystal clear on the sides, because whenever I was looking at the screen, at the movie, say the race car, they're really zoning in on this... The fact that it was blurry on the sides really didn't bother me all that much. Not at all. Not at all. But yeah, but yeah guys, this has been a Film Center. This is a bit of a double episode here with Ayatsi and talking about Regal Cinema's 270. Nicholas, what is your final verdict on the 270? I think it could be game-changing if they do it in a way that is complementary to it and not just a gimmick. I couldn't agree more. Hey, guys, my name's Derek Johnson II. I'm Nicholas Killian. And we'll talk to you next time. See ya. 
This has been Film Center on Comic-Con Radio. Check out our previous episodes at ComicConRadio.com. You can follow the show at Film Center News on all major social media platforms. Tune in next Wednesday for a fresh update. Until next time, this has been Film Center.